خلافت کیا ہے ایک فضل عظیم رب رحما ہے سراسر نور و رحمت علم و حکمت کا گلستہ ہے خلافت کیا ہے ایک فضل عظیم رب رحما ہے Following his continuous efforts of spreading the message of peace to world leaders and communities, Hazur made another historic address, this time in Los Angeles. On May 11, 2013, Hazur Khalifa the V, accompanied by a police escort from Bethel Hamid Mosque in Chino, California, traveled 45 miles west to the heart of Los Angeles to the prestigious Montage Hotel in Beverly Hills a venue famous for hosting heads of state and high political officials. Upon arrival, Hazur addressed over a dozen diverse media outlets in a 30-minute press conference on a range of global issues. He then participated in a group meeting with the prominent political officials, which included California Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, Los Angeles Mayor-elect Eric Garcetti, and four other members of the U.S. Congress. Hazur then proceeded to the main Marquesa Ballroom, which was packed with over 360 guests including foreign consul generals, federal, state, and city officials, professors, judges, thought leaders, members of the military, police chiefs, fire chiefs, interfaith leaders, and other influential personalities. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. We start our proceedings with the recitation of the Holy Quran with translation by Imam Azhar Hanif. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين لله كونوا كوابين لله شهداء بالقسط ولا يجرمنكم شنعان قوم على على تعدلوا يعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين The verses of the Holy Quran which I have just recited are from chapter number 5 verse number 9 and chapter 21 verse number 108 the translation is as follows. O ye who believe, be steadfast 
in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity, and let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just, that is nearer to righteousness. And fear Allah, surely Allah is well aware of what you do. And we have not sent thee, O Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but as a mercy for all peoples. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, ever merciful. Beloved Hazur, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA, I'm honored to welcome all of you to this special reception with His Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmad, the fifth successor to the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community. His Holiness is a tireless champion of global peace. Last year, he made his first ever visit to Washington, D.C., where he gave a historic address at U.S. Capitol Hill on the subject of just relations between nations. His Holiness has recently corresponded with prominent world leaders in the Islamic world and the West, warning of the dire consequences of a nuclear war. His Holiness has also addressed the European Union Parliament in Brussels on overcoming the challenge of extremism. Today, our community has gathered to share His Holiness's wisdom to Southern California. We are honored to have among us a diverse array of leaders. Our guests today represent 19 countries, 32 cities, 27 universities, and six religious denominations. In this room today include members of the United States Congress, members of the California State Senate and Assembly, members of the Los Angeles City Council, mayors, police chiefs, fire chiefs, members of uniformed services, foreign consul generals, judges, interfaith leaders, NGO leaders, think tank leaders, professors, authors, and journalists. Indeed, the diversity of today's audience embodies the diversity of the great city of Los Angeles. Looking around the room, the message of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is one that embraces all of humanity. Our community is perhaps the oldest active Muslim organization in the nation, having been established in 1920 and with the longest running American Muslim magazine, The Muslim Sunrise. Here on the West Coast, our community established a presence in the early 1970s and now has four Southern California chapters. Globally, our community is a dynamic, fast-growing international revival movement within Islam. Founded in 1889, it now spans over 200 countries with membership exceeding tens of millions. A unique feature of our community, which is also the driving force behind our worldwide efforts towards peace, is Khilafat, or spiritual successorship. His Holiness is spiritual leader and guide to tens of millions of people around the world, and his directives are aimed at fostering absolute justice, human welfare, and social harmony. Under the leadership of its spiritual successors, our community has now built over 15,000 mosques, 500 schools, and 30 hospitals, and has translated the Holy Quran into 70 languages. It propagates the true teachings of Islam and a message of peace and tolerance through a 24-hour satellite television channel, MTA, the internet, alislam.org, and print, Islam International Publications. 
The community also founded an independent disaster relief and development NGO named Humanity First, which has sent volunteers to help in all major disasters in the United States for more than a decade, including Hurricane Sandy last year. Finally, the community has successfully collected more than 25,000 bags of blood as part of its national Muslims for Life annual blood drive campaign to honor the victims of the attacks of September 11th. We truly hope you enjoy today's program. And with that introduction, I now invite California Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom to welcome us. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much, Your Holiness, for taking the time to be here and for all of you for taking the time to assemble here today on this special day. I, I think just reflecting on the world we're living in briefly, I think most of us would acknowledge that all around the world, nations and people have certainly been torn apart because of racial and religious and ethnic controversies that have fueled, in many cases, fanaticism and terror. Yet here we are in Los Angeles, the most diverse city in the most diverse state, California, in the world's most diverse democracy, America. And I have long believed, and I hope many of you would agree with me, that the world looks to us to see that it's possible to live together, to advance together, and prosper together across every conceivable and imaginable difference. I mean, we're a state at our best of dreamers, a state, Your Holiness, of doers, a state of entrepreneurs, of innovators that have long prided ourselves on being on the leading and cutting edge of new ideas. But at the end of the day, and if there's nothing you take back, Your Holiness, than this, this is a state that doesn't tolerate its diversity. It truly celebrates its diversity, it unites around the things that bind us together. I was reflecting when I had opportunity to learn more your Holiness, about your service, uh, particularly about your contribution to the people of Ghana in the late 1970s and early 80s. And it reminded me of something remarkable that happened here in our great state a few years ago in Death Valley. You may even recall this. In the winter of 2004, there were seven inches of rain that fell on Death Valley. A few months later, the spring of 2005, the entire valley was carpeted with flowers. And it was just a reminder that Death Valley wasn't dead, it was dormant. It was waiting for the seeds of possibility to be sown. And I think about, Your Holiness, the extraordinary work you did in Ghana, particularly in their agricultural commitment, bringing wheat to the people of Ghana, it had never been done in the history of that country. You sowed the seeds of possibility. And it's a reminder to all of us as we deal with the issue of ignorance and poverty and disease as you have committed your life to, that when the right conditions come along, success is irreversible. It's inevitable. Success simply will find its way. So I want to thank you for your constancy, your faith, your devotion to the cause of peace and poverty eradication to your extraordinary humanitarian work around the world. And I want to thank you in closing for this perhaps more than anything else, for reminding us, Your Holiness, that the world is way too small, our wisdom way too limited, and our life is way too short to win victories, fleeting victories at the expense of others, that our job is to triumph together. So I thank you, Your Holiness, for your time, and thank you for being here. And on behalf of the state, I wanted to present to you uh, a small token of our appreciation on behalf of Governor Brown and to those statewide officials that are assembled here, and on behalf of all of us uh, in California, recognize this day uh, in your honor. Thank you, Your Holiness. <laughs> Doctor? I now invite the Honorable Lee Baca, Sheriff of Los Angeles County.
Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I am extremely grateful, Your Holiness, for the fact that you took time from your worldwide responsibilities to make a visit here in the great county and city of Los Angeles, where each and every one of us here now, the honorable elected officials, the consulates from various countries around the world, and men and women who have a keen interest from Los Angeles and San Bernardino counties, as well as the adjoining counties north and south, east and west, with the exception of a few. But this is an opportunity for us here, all together, to reflect on what it means for us to have you visiting today. His Holiness, you are a spiritual leader of worldwide stature, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslims community, of which this is the first visit that you, Your Honor, have been able to make to Los Angeles. I'm very thankful for Dr. Asif Mahmoud for all the work that he has done in teaching me about Pakistan. Uh, I have been there, as you know, three times. And as a result of those visits, I was able to understand what is meant by diplomacy in the work that you do. What is important about this trip is that it's no doubt that the United States as a nation cares about Pakistan. There's no doubt that everyone in this room cares about the significance of the religious societies that are within our great world. Therefore, to have someone as you come here and knowing that you've made a huge impact in all parts of the world to the point where we are witnessing today that your presence can draw us all to you for the sake of wisdom and the circumstances that would lead to, as our Lieutenant Governor said in his speech, a greater and more peaceful and prosperous world. I am also thankful to Dr. Kareem Ahmed, who many of us know, who was the force behind uh, the energy and the wings beneath Dr. Mahmoud's uh, particular effort as well. And so therefore you have here in Los Angeles great friends who are the diaspora from Pakistan who in turn have made themselves a force for good within the political structure as well as the social and business structure of Los Angeles County. What we believe is necessary is that 120 years ago you represent a great reformer who's working in the East with the explanation and real true meaning of Islam. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who is the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslims, could foresee the grave problems with wrong meanings of teachings of Islam and denounced the concept of violence and killings and came up with a strong argument for war with debates and arguments, not with guns, swords, and the bloodshed. He quickly became a household name by the impact of his magical writings and the dynamic and substantive speeches. His focus was, in fact, education in all forms. And you see that not long ago, the community has produced great legends in the form of first Muslim physics Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Abdul Salam first ever Muslim president of the International Court of Justice, and the list goes on and on. So you do see successful people around you here who are impacting this society very positively. His Holiness, you provide leadership to the world in general and Muslims in particular to guide them in the true principles of Islam, denouncing any forms of violence and terrorism, especially in the name of religion. You very clearly describe the duty of patriotism to the country of all Pakistanis who are in your particular influence. You have spent ample time in West Africa before being elected to be the caliph and understand the issues that part of the world in all parts of the world that you've been. You are the pioneer in growing wheat in the soil of Ghana as mentioned by Lieutenant Governor. I myself do a lot of work to promote peace because as we've spoken earlier, 
when Councilman Zine and I met you at Los Angeles Airport. As to the purpose of police diplomacy and how we can engage the dialogue within the structures of your particular points of peace and harmony among religions and cultures and races. And because of that, I owe a great debt of gratitude uh, to the Pakistani American Society uh, here in Los Angeles that has aggressively adopted America as their land to live. But their faith draws back to you, Your Holiness. And it's with your effort that I am so impressed with everyone here that understands the significance of you helping make the world a safer place. I will close with something that is on the vein of a spiritual thought, Your Holiness. And that is, if God were to ask, if, I, if one were to ask God regarding his wisdom, concerns, and purpose of the Muslim society, I have no doubt that God would say, you, your holiness, pleases him. Thank you so much for your great visit. I now invite Councilman Dennis Zine for a special presentation and some remarks. Thank you. Can I get have my colleague, Eric Garcetti? Eric Garcetti? Come up here and join me, please. I had the honor last week to meet Holiness at Los Angeles International Airport, and it was a warm greeting. And at that time, I wanted to express the appreciation of the people of Los Angeles welcoming to the City of the Angels. And I presented a, a proclamation on behalf of the people of Los Angeles. But I want to do something more than that. We talk about people visiting different jurisdictions and giving them a key, a key to the city, a key that will open up all the doors, find where all the secrets are, find where everybody's at. A key to the city to have access to openness is what we believe in here in the City of the Angels, to have access and openness. And today, along with my colleague Eric Garcetti, as we serve on the council together uh, to make that presentation, and I want to do that in respect for the people of the City of Los Angeles while we're here in Beverly Hills. And Your Holiness, what you've assembled, and I go to many events, you've assembled an incredible audience, you've an, assembled an incredible list of congressional representatives, state representatives, local representatives. You've got three chiefs of police that I can see in the audience from Long Beach, from Los Angeles. You've got the sheriff of the city of Los Angeles. I'm sure there's a chief here from Beverly Hills. I know there's Chief McSweeney from the LA County Sheriff's Department. You have brought together people, and that's what you believe in, peace, love, harmony, and bringing people together. You've been successful in doing that for this luncheon today to honor and show respect for you. And I also want to uh, acknowledge the folks that helped put this together, the staff that have put this together. Dr. Asif Mahmoud and also Kareem Ahmad, who have helped put this together, along with the incredible crew that has brought us all together for this memorable luncheon, this celebration, in honor of you for all the good work that you have done and you'll continue to do on behalf of the people, not only of Pakistan, of the world. And a couple comments from my colleague, and then we'll make the presentation. For all the events you go to, you will, you will seldom see the golden key presented. Today, you will see the golden key presented to you, Your Holiness. <laughs> I, uh, thank you so much, Dennis. I shared my words upstairs, so I will keep them genuinely brief. I've seen um, four keys to the city given out in my 12 years as a city council member, and this is a very special honor indeed that is reserved for the most special of visitors. People often ask for the key to the city. If you live in the city, you cannot have one. You have to be from outside the city. <laughs> and this key has been given to only a few, a Nobel Prize winner that I know of, a head of state, and it's most fitting that for you as representative of the Maria community here that we give this to you today. God bless you and thank you very much.
I now invite the Honorable U.S. Congresswoman Karen Bass to please share her remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanted to begin by thanking my good friend Kareem, I'm not sure where Kareem, Kareem is right there, for uh, his leadership and his effort in following up in our community and really instilling and spreading the values that His Holiness represents, and I want to thank him for today. I also want to thank Your Holiness for the opportunity to address today's distinguished guests. It's truly an honor spending a few moments in the presence of such a transformative figure, a man who has spent a lifetime promoting peace and understanding around the world. I don't have to tell you that we all live in an ever turbulent world. Tensions are constantly on the rise and human rights are often abused because the abused lack the means to speak out and those with the means lack the courage to speak up. There are still too many wars, too much famine, and too many struggles for basic human rights that many of us take for granted. We aren't having the dialogues needed to foster understanding across religious and territorial lines in support of peace. This is why the work of Your Holiness is so needed in our world today. As both a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Subcommittee on Africa and Global Human Rights, I've had the privilege of traveling throughout the world and witnessing firsthand the limitations of government power when it comes to resolving conflicts and promoting stability. Government is doing great work around the world, but there are times when a much higher power is needed to show us the way forward to living in peace and prosperity for all. That higher power is represented by your holiness and your work helping to foresee every day to heal the world. I'm encouraged by your leadership in a worldwide campaign to convey the peaceful message of Islam and discourage the misinformation we sometimes hear. Your Holiness has not sat silently in the face of human rights abuses. You have led and passionately advocated for the establishment of universal human rights and helped to alleviate suffering in developing nations by helping to facilitate access to food for the hungry and clean water and electricity for those working to build a better life. I leave here today inspired by your vision, courage, humility, and dignity, and I hope to be a partner with you in the shared values for peace, understanding, and human rights for all. Thank you, Your Holiness, for all that you do, and it's an honor to have you today in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. I now invite the Honorable U.S. Congresswoman Judy Chu. What an honor it is to welcome His Holiness Hadrat Mizrat Mazrur Ahmad to his first trip to the West Coast and to California. I was there in Washington, D.C. when His Holiness gave his message of peace. It was so powerful, and I know that your presence here will be just as electrifying. I am here because of the tenets of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community that bring people together in peace across the world, no matter their gender, nationality, or faith. And I thank Dr. Asif Mahmood and Dr. Karim Ahmed for doing such a good job in reaching out to me and other elected officials to make sure that we would all come together at this moment. I am here because His Holiness preaches debate and communication. I am here because His Holiness calls for separation of religion and government. I am here because His Holiness stands against terrorism and war. But there are many across the world who see these tenets as threats to their religion and their way of life. And as members of the Ahmadi Muslim community, uh, you have been special targets of discrimination. You have had your graveyards vandalized, your voting rights taken away, and many of your brothers and your loved ones have paid the ultimate sacrifice because of your faith. So when His Holiness calls for peace, for love of all, hatred for none, his message rings true because you truly understand what peace and love cost. I hope you know that you are not in this alone. I am chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which has 41 members of Congress, and we fight hard against intolerance and racial profiling and for an appreciation 
of all our cultures. I am so proud to stand beside you in peace and understanding and to welcome His Holiness to the great state of California. And I would like to present my certificate of congressional recognition to His Holiness uh, for your wonderful presence and message. Thank you. I now invite U.S. Congresswoman Julia Brownlee to share her remarks. Thank you, Your Holiness, and thank you to the entire Ahmadiyya Muslim community and to Kareem Ahmed for the great honor of being invited uh, to join you today. Your Holiness, I am a new member of Congress, and I am most honored to represent the good people of Ventura County. Ventura County survived a major and treacherous fire last week that burned over 24,000 acres without any loss of life. And this week, we are reminded of the profound goodness and grace of our communities after so many people from inside and outside of our county sacrifice to protect human life and property and to voluntarily come to each other, come to each other's aid to provide food, bedding, comfort, love, and reassurance. We as a county are very, very blessed. It is such a great honor and privilege to represent the people of Ventura County, but it is also moments like this one today when I am able to meet Your Holiness, one of the greatest ecumenical leaders of our time that makes being a new member of Congress even a greater honor. Your Holiness, your dedication to promoting world peace, human justice, and religious freedom is so critically important to our world today. Your motto, love for all, hatred for none, has made a real difference, not only in your community, but in so many diverse communities all over the world. While we all firmly believe that church and state or religion and state must be separate, our world needs every politician and every religious leader to carry your motto and all of your peaceful messages in our hearts, in our minds, and in our souls. I want to thank your holiness for the difference you make in the lives of those you touch and for being a great interpreter of peace. Thank you again profoundly for reminding us again what the great possibilities are for a future where every human can live in peace. Thank you very much. I now invite Matt Dobinet from the office of U.S. Congressman Brad Sherman for a special presentation. I'd also like to ask our state controller John Chang, if you'd come up with me and make this presentation as well. Before I turn it over to our state controller, let me say thank you to Dr. Asif Mahmood and Kareem Ahmad for having us here today in the whole community. Your Holiness, you graced us with your presence in Washington, D.C. last June. The Congressman was so grateful for your blessing, for you coming to the Capitol to address members of Congress on the work you're doing around the world to promote peace, to promote harmony, and promote cultures and religious groups working together to make a brighter future for all our children. So on behalf of Congressman Brad Sherman, who couldn't be here today, welcome to our city, welcome to our community. We thank you for your blessings. And on behalf of Congressman Brad Sherman, I want to present a very special congressional resolution along with my great friend, State Controller John Chung, if you'd like to say a few words as well. 
His Holiness, uh, in a world that has witnessed too much hatred and ugliness, you are a pure sign of hope and inspiration. The peace that you bring to us made it be a symbol of the promise of the world's citizenry, and I, I am so honored and delighted to join you this afternoon. On behalf of Congressman Brad Sherman, we'd like to present you with this plaque. Thank you. I now invite Dr. Asanullah Zafar, the President of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA, to introduce His Holiness. It is a great honor for me to introduce Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad to the August audience which is gathered here today. He is the fifth successor of the Caliphate or Khilafat of the Messiah Ahmad. Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani Salam. He carries those spiritual blessings and he's here to share them with you. His passion, as has already been stated, is to promote harmony and peace among mankind. It is important to understand the distinction in the Quranic expression between mankind and believers. And too often, the arguments are made how the disbelievers are treated in the Muslim and the Quranic traditions. Well, the disbelievers at that time were enemies. But he really is talking about mankind. The teachings of Messiah Ahmad were primarily based on the teachings and writings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's a great myth that he spent his life fighting and you know, overcoming. The fact is, he spent his life praying, day in and day out, and even at nights, he would do it. And this is codified in the Quran, and the expression which primarily, I believe, explains Hazrat Mizra Masroor Ahmad's passion is a verse where God is addressing the Prophet Muhammad <coughs> Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's saying, are you going to kill yourself or hurt yourself in your passion to make sure that this message of peace and blessings is heard and accepted by mankind at large? And this is how committed he is to the, to the world peace and to harmony among, man, among all men. And the last thing I want to mention is that by conveying this message, there is something added beyond the expressions which are made by others and at large. And that is that there is a spirituality which goes with it. And the thing that you know, this world needs more than anything else is that spiritual awakening, which will help all the good things to happen. So with this, I will respectfully introduce Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad Khalifa al Masih al Khamis.
Please be seated. Thank you very much. Please be seated. شیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آل ڈسٹنگ گیس السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ پیس پیس اینڈ بلیسنگ آف اللہ بی اپون یو آل فرسٹ آف آل آئی وڈ لائک ٹو تھینک آل آف آور گیس ہو ہیو ایکسیپٹیڈ آور انویٹیشن ٹو دس ایونٹ اینڈ ہو ہیو ہو بائی کمنگ have enlightened the occasion. I also thank all those honorable guests who have spoken and uh, praised the, the community. And uh, I also thank all those who have shown gesture and given the, the gifts, and especially the key of this area. Thank you very much for this. <clears throat> Your kind approach towards an Islamic religious organization is clearly demonstrated by your attendance and shows that you have a very tolerant attitude and a keen desire to learn about Islam. With these few words, I would like to turn towards an issue of great importance and of which there is an urgent need to deliberate and talk about in today's world. What I wish to discuss is something that has created Islamophobia in the Western and non-Muslim world. There can be no doubt that this state of fear and anxiety has been fueled by the acts of certain so-called Muslims or so-called Muslim groups. However, there is also no, no doubt that the acts of terrorism or extremism they perpetrate have nothing whatsoever to do with the true teachings of Islam. The very meaning of Islam is peace, security, and giving a guarantee of protection against all forms of harm and evil. Indeed, the Holy Quran declares that this is the teaching that every single prophet of God taught. Islam requires Muslims to abide by its teachings. And fundamental amongst them is that they must not only fulfill the rights owed to God Almighty, but just as importantly, they must also fulfill the rights owed to God's creation. The Quran has shined a bright light on the beauty of the teachings of all prophets by making it clear that they all drew mankind's attention to fulfilling the rights owed both to God and to his creation. How then could it be possible that on the one hand, God has praised the qualities of all religious uh, or religions for urging mankind to fulfill the rights of God and of man. Yet, on the other hand, God could enjoin the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, upon whom the great book was revealed to not establish peace and security in the world. How could it be possible that they were instructed to cause destruction and to destroy the peace and security of the world? Certainly, no wise person could ever accept this. True justice and fairness requires 
that rather than judging Islam in a prejudiced manner or by making false assumptions based on hearsay, a person should study the religion and try to develop an understanding of its teachings before criticizing it and its founder. An informed decision about any issue can only be made once a person has studied its teachings in depth and strived to learn the truth. The truth or reality of any faith can only be learned from those who are practicing or striving to follow its true and authentic teach, uh, teachings. Today, it is the Ahmadiyya Muslim community which claims to follow the original and true teachings of Islam and is spreading it. Upon hearing, the, hearing this, you may question how Ahmadis can claim that they alone understand the true teaching of Islam. Given that a large portion of Muslims and Islamic clergy do not even consider Ahmadis to be Muslim. To answer this question, firstly, and as I have already said, the Quran has clearly stated that Islam is a religion of peace and that has nothing to do with terrorism or extreme, uh, extreme, uh, extremism. And secondly, in a grand prophecy made by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, he said that as had happened with all previous religions, a time would come when the state of Muslims would become ruined and corrupted. The Muslim scholars would spread false doctrines and in ideologies, and there would be great division and conflict within the Muslim world. Whilst the Holy Quran would remain preserved in its original state, false commentaries and interpretations would be made which would lead Muslims away from its true teachings. According to the prophecy, when such a des uh, desperate state of uh, affairs came to pass, God Almighty would send a person as the promised Messiah in Imam Mahdi to rejuvenate Islam. He would clarify the correct meanings of the Quran and would inform the world of the true Islam practiced by the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, and his rightly guided successor 1,400 years ago. The Prophet Messiah would guide the world towards living together in love, peace, and harmony, and would foster a spirit of mutual understanding and reconciliation. The Prophet Messiah would do all of this in light of the shining example of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, and the true teachings of the Quran. Furthermore, the Prophet Messiah would bring an end to all forms of religious warfare. We Ahmadi Muslims believe that the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian, is that promised person foretold by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. We believe he came as a beacon of light to convey the true and luminous teachings of Islam to the entire world. With these words of introduction, I shall now briefly present some examples of the beautiful and peaceful characteristics of Islam. Before I give specific examples, I should mention that the person who followed the teachings of the Quran to the greatest extent possible was the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. <clears throat> that is why one of his wives once said that his morals and his acts were a perfect mirror image, image of uh, image and reflection of the 
teachings of the Quran. Consequently, if a person studies the Quran, then the life and character of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah upon him, will naturally become clear and apparent. In the limited time available, it is not possible for me to cover all aspects of the Quran. In fact, it is not possible for me to cover even one aspect of its teachings. Nonetheless, I shall try to briefly explain one part of Islamic teachings, which has sadly become very misunderstood in the modern world, and thus has caused a great deal of fear to develop in the non-Muslim world. I refer to the teachings of the Quran and the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah upon him, in relation to establishing peace in the world. The Quran forms its very first verse and chapter gives a message of peace. Uh, from the, its very first verse and chapter gives the message of peace. The first verse of the Quran reads, all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. This verse means that the God who Muslims worship is the one God who sustains and authorizes uh, and nourishes everything and everyone without any distinction. He fulfills all of the needs of his creation. In other words, he is the God of the Christians, the God of the Jews, the God of the Hindus, and indeed he even gives nourishment and provides to those who do not believe in his existence. Whenever I reflect upon this particular point, I realize that I believe in that one God who is the Lord of all nations, all races, and all religions. And so it becomes impossible that I could ever develop any hatred in my heart for any nation, any race, or any religion. In this context, I would like to say that my sympathies and prayers are with the victims of the recent Boston attack. attack. We fully condemn that one, that attack as well. A Muslim has been commanded by God Almighty to pray five times a day and to recite the opening chapter of the Quran in each unit of prayer. And so, at the very least, a Muslim must repeat the prayer that his Lord is the Lord of all of the worlds at least 32 times each and every day. The entire world is God's creation and he loves his creation dearly. Thus, the reason we praise the Lord of all the worlds and repeat this prayer so many times each day is so that we realize and accept the beauty of all people and all nations because they are all part of God's creation. When the beauty and merit of something is accepted, then it is impossible to bear hatred or malice towards it. Rather, love and compassion shine forth. If this point is understood, then the question cannot even arise in the heart of a true Muslim that he should bear enmity, ill will, or hatred towards any of God's creation. This is why the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, who had the greatest insight and understanding of God's word, used to recite the words all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds, not just in his obligatory prayers, but also in the countless voluntary prayers he used to offer, more than anyone else. His heart was consumed by love for, for all 
and was entirely free from any form of hatred or spite. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, had love for all of God's creation, but most particularly for mankind, because humans have been deemed to be the best of God's creation. Human beings have been given wisdom to differentiate between right and wrong. And so there is reward for goodness and punishment for wrongdoing. Due to the infinite, infinite love God instilled in the heart of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, for all people, he used to feel great anguish and despair for the state of mankind. He was constantly overwhelmed by a concern that due to wrongdoing, a large number of people were, were at grave risk of incurring the wrath of God and his chastisement. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, used to spend night upon night beseeching his Lord and praying that those who had forgotten God become guided to the right path. He used to feel this burden with such intensity that Allah the Almighty has said in the Quran that the Holy Prophet would grieve himself to death due to his anguish for mankind. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, was held captive and enslaved in his heartfelt distress and desire to save the people of the world from destruction. And so it is a cause of great just injustice that many people today try to stain his blessed character by saying that, God forbid, he brought teachings of cruelty, oppression, and injustice. Today, when we, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, raise the slogan of love for all and hatred for none as a means to establish global peace, we do so directly in fulfillment of the teachings of the Holy Quran and the practice of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, was so consumed by his desire to serve humanity and to fulfill the rights of mankind that throughout his life he stood ever ready for this cause. Even after becoming a prophet of God, which was a huge responsibility and the greatest task imaginable. He said that if any person, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, called him at any time for the mission of serving humanity, then he would most certainly join them in their effort to serve mankind. This was his example, whereby irrespective of religion, if a person was in any kind of need or came from a deprived segment of society, he deemed it essential to come forward to help and assist him. Despite his great status as Islam's founder and a prophet of God, he deemed it of utmost importance to work towards this pious objective with non-Muslims. The question may well arise in some people's mind that if the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, was filled with so much love for humanity, then why is his name associated with warfare? Why did he take part in some wars and why did he send some armies into battle? To answer this question, we must assess whether an entirely pacifistic attitude whereby war is war in all circumstances is wrong is a correct doctrine or alternatively whether in extreme circumstances fighting may be permitted 
and if in certain circumstances it is permissible, then what are the required conditions and to what extent is war allowed? What does Islam teach us about this? As I explained earlier, when a Muslim praises the Lord of all the worlds, the beauty of God's creation comes before him. And he is compelled to praise and be attracted to it. When this beauty is acknowledged, one cannot harbor any ill will or malice towards God's creation. However, there will always be some people who do not act upon this teaching and who are determined to spread disorder in society and wider world. Islam has given very clear and detailed guidance about how to reform such people so that global peace and harmony can be maintained. Allah the Almighty says in the Quran, had not Allah repelled some men by others, the earth would indeed be full of mischief. But Allah is Lord of grace to all peoples. If we ponder the meaning of this, we see that peace is undoubtedly the best state of affairs, and so Allah has naturally instilled its attraction inside the human mind. However, sometimes man goes against his natural tendencies and inclinations. His greed, envy, selfish interests, and hatred overpowers him and incite him to such an extent that he no longer has any concern for the rights of others. As a result, disorder develops in society, in a country, and in the wider world. Such people move far away from peace. It becomes their objective to suppress and violate the freedoms that society hold dear. They attack basic human rights, such as freedom of conscience and freedom of thought by using force and severity. Indeed, such people also target religious freedom and seek to suppress it. It was when such subjugating circumstances arose that Allah granted permission to the early Muslims to respond to force with force. This permission was granted only as a means to stop disorder, to stop cruelty, and establish peace and harmony. Allah has said in the Quran that he bestows his grace and blessings on all of the worlds. He does not favor any nation or region. He does not desire peace for just a limited few. Rather, he wants to see the entire world filled with peace, harmony, and compassion. In the, in the sight of Allah, all of his creation is equal and the same. If God has enabled someone to become wealthy, then that person does not have the right to deprive a poor person of his rights. Similarly, if any nation or country becomes powerful and wealthy, it does not have the right to usurp the rights of weaker and poorer countries. God Almighty has clearly said that such cruelties only create deviance and conflict. In the eyes of God, peace is a great and paramount objective. And so, establish, so, so to establish it, if you occasionally have to sacrifice a smaller ideal, then there is no harm as it is for the greater good of mankind. When permission for defensive war was first given to in Islam, it was given with the reason that whilst Muslims truly desired peace, the disbelievers wished to destroy the peace. If permission to fight back had not been granted to the Muslims at that point, then all religious religions would have been placed in grave danger. Allah the Almighty says in the Holy Quran, Permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made because they have been wronged and Allah indeed has, a, has power to help them. Those 
who have been driven out from their homes unjustly only because they said our Lord is Allah and if Allah did not repel some people by means of others there would surely have been pulled down cloisters and churches and synagogues and mosques wherein the name of Allah is oft commemorated and Allah will surely help one who helps him Allah is indeed powerful mighty chapter 22 verse 40 41 thus it is quite clear that Islam has made every effort to establish peace and every every effort to protect all other religions even where defensive war was permitted to the Muslims <coughs> The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, gave extremely strict rules of engagement to the Muslim armies, which they were compelled to abide by. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, taught that during wars, only those people who were directly engaged in the war could be fought. He gave strict instructions that no innocent person was ever to be attacked. He, the, no woman, child, or elderly person was ever to be attacked. He taught that no religious leader or priest could be attacked in his place of worship. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah upon him, further taught that no person could be forced or compelled to convert to Islam. He taught that when Muslims were forced to fight for the cause of peace, they must not create fear or terror amongst the members of the public, nor should they be treated in a harsh or severe manner. He taught that prisoners of war should be treated with even greater care and attention than a person would pay to himself. He taught that buildings should not be targeted or destroyed and the trees should not be felled. Thus, even where conditions existed, where war was justified, the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, gave countless guidelines and instructions to his followers, which were essential to follow. I have only mentioned very few. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said very clearly that whosoever acted against these rules of engagement would not be fighting in accordance to the commands of Allah to establish peace but rather would be fighting for their own personal interests, uh, interests or gain. Those who criticize the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, in today's world should reflect upon whether these instructions are being followed in any of the wars taking place today. It is not the case that today, is it not the case that today's horrific weapons are being used which are causing innocent people to be killed indiscriminately. Yet the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, prohibited any form of collateral damage to the extent that once during a war, a companion accidentally <coughs> killed a child and this caused great displeasure to the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him who severely rebuked him for this act. Another incident shows that how much respect the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of uh, Allah be upon him, had for all of mankind. Once a funeral procession passed by, and as a mark of respect, he immediately stood up. Upon seeing this, a companion uh, commented in surprise that this is the funeral procession of a Jewish person. Hearing this, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said, was he not a human? Respect for all humans is obligatory. These are the characteristics and qualities which develop mutual respect in society and help develop peace. Today's world is ever increasing in its criticism, uh, criticism of Islam and its founder, despite the fact that Islam's teachings and the Holy Prophet's every act were filled with love for humanity and a desire to establish peace in the world. 
Sadly, today's world does not see or understand what is really happening today. As I have already said, the evil acts conducted by extremists claiming to be Muslims have nothing to do with the real teachings of Islam. If there is oppression in Muslim countries or the rights of the public are being usurped, then that too is completely contrary to the teachings of Islam. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said that such cruelties were based only on vested interests and certainly were not for the sake of God. Bearing all of this in mind, <clears throat> the urgent need of the time is that instead of thinking ill or holding misconceptions about Islam, all those who desire peace should join together and discuss how cruel and unjust elements can be stopped. Defaming or unjustly <clears throat> attacking Islam is not the right way. Leaving aside certain Muslim countries and groups, there are also non-Muslims who are conducting acts through which innocent people, women and children are losing their lives on the basis of establishing peace. The direction the world is moving in suggests that the dark shadow of war is being cast over a very large part of the globe. If war breaks out, then countless innocent women, children, and elderly people will all die. The destruction will be greater than was witnessed in the previous two world wars. And I have, uh, I say this knowing full well that during the Second World War, tens of millions of people lost their lives. The world's population is now far greater and there has also been a vast increase in both the number of weapons of mass dest uh, destruction and the countries that have developed a thirst for war. Under these circumstances, destruction will also be manifold. In light of all of this, it is imperative that the world and particularly the major powers reflect upon what efforts are required to save the world from a horrific destruction. Fear of Islam or attempt to defame it will not achieve anything or lead to peace and reconciliation. Instead, the key to peace is to stop cruelty and oppression wherever it occurs with justice and equality. Only when this principle is followed will global peace develop. This will only happen when the people of the world come to recognize their creator. It is my ardent hope and prayer that the entire world urgently comes to understand the needs of the time before it is too late. <clears throat> At the end, I would like to once again thank all of our guests who have taken time and effort to come and attend this event. May Allah bless you all. Thank you very much. According to our tradition, we offer silent prayer at the end of the formal function. So I will offer silent prayer. The Ahmadis will follow me and all others can offer their prayer in their own way. <clears throat> I mean, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, 
as you're enjoying your lunch, um, I would like to announce that His Holiness will be available after lunch to meet with guests on my left. After you've completed your lunch, you can proceed to my left and His Holiness will be able to meet a few guests for a short period of time. I also wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge several guests who are in the audience. U.S. Congressman Dana Rohrbacher from the 48th District and U.S. Congresswoman Gloria Negrete McLeod from the 35th District are both in attendance. We also have several California uh, Assembly members, Anthony Rendon, and Ed Chow and Adrian Nazarian. And we have uh, from the California State Senate, Kern Price. We have several professors who are in attendance, over 40, and several deans of universities, which include the Dean of UCLA Law School, Rachel Moran, and the Dean of USC School of Cinematic Studies, Elizabeth Bailey. We have several NGOs, Development, Interfaith, Legal, Human, and Civil Rights. And finally, we have many consulates in attendance from Indonesia, Guinea, Sri Lanka, Peru, Botswana, Burkina Faso, Egypt, Philippines, Switzerland, and Belgium. And as I mentioned, we have many members of the law enforcement here, particularly wanted to acknowledge the San Bernardino County Sheriff, Jim McDonald, as well, in addition to the Chiefs of Police in Pasadena and Long Beach. Thank you very much.